Happy Sunday everyone, uh, this is Nicole from Wake Up America and I wanted to talk a little bit about the radio frequency identification uh, chips that they plan on using. So I'm going to go over the Wikipedia article first and kind of uh, give you guys like a little rundown and then talk about it a bit. So this is directly from Wikipedia. Ooh, you know what? I'm going to refill my coffee real quick. I'll be right back. One second. All right, here we go. So, let's see here. Um, I'm using my camera for the video because my computer produces really bad video. This one washes me out and makes me look like <laughs> like I've got a, a metallic-looking pale vampire. Sorry, guys, but um, it it I can't get lighting right. It's always a problem. Okay, so radio frequency identification. And by the way, happy Sunday. I hope everybody's having a good weekend, and that all my uh, you know, all my friends that, I, you know, I have a few people that are friends of mine who post on the YouTube channel, and I hope you're all doing really well. So, radio frequency identification uses electromagnetic fields to automatically identify and track tags attached to objects. The tags contain electronically stored information. And this is from Wikipedia again. Passive tags collect energy from a nearby RFID reader's Interrogating radio waves. Active tags have a local power source such as battery and may operate hundreds of meters, blah, blah, blah. Unlike a barcode, the tag will not need to be within the line of sight of the reader, so it may be embedded in the tracked object. Okay, so one of the applications for this, guys, is that whether it's this chip or another one, they are going to make, they're planning on making a microchip. This has been in the works for a long time. That would go in your hand, right? A lot of times they talk about putting it right in here between your thumb and your finger. Um, and of course, you know, people who are familiar with the book of Revelation will uh, probably recognize it or call it the mark of the beast. Now, the thing about this whole chip idea is that, firstly, I'd like to say that God actually does mark his people, right, with, the Bible talks about how he, he mark. you know, our hands are supposed to be well, he trains our hands for war and our fingers to bat for battle, but God marks what is his, okay? If you read Ezekiel, and I'll just pull that scripture up real quick, it talks about how uh, Ezekiel is seeing this vision, um, and he hears, as he sees the temple and all this stuff going on, he hears a voice that tells him, you know, that's not telling him, but telling an angel, I suppose, to go out and mark the foreheads of all those who weep in... Uh, truly grieve over or over how bad things are, you know? And so those are marked out as gods. And the belief is that the mark that was put on the foreheads of the people was a tov. So let me pull up the scripture from Ezekiel really quick. And I know this isn't super organized. It's because I just did this kind of, been tried to get all my housework and everything done early today. So I could do this with you guys. So The idea is that this RFID chipping or whatever chip they end up using, okay, is going to be for to buy or sell so that nobody can buy or sell and so that you have a form of identification that nobody can, you know, steal from you. Um, but this, you could say, in a sense, is like the enemy, right? Marking what he feels is his. But it's also idolaters, there's been an issue throughout, you know, since the beginning, even with Cain, you could say that there have been people who were jealous of God. They couldn't just worship God. They wanted to become God, you know. Um, they couldn't be part of 
building something for God. They wanted to be the focal point for that, for that entire thing. They want the worship, right? So if God marks those that are his, people who envy God and want to become God themselves are also going to want to mark what's theirs, right? And how are they going to mark people? It's not going to be with a spiritual mark like in Ezekiel. It would be with, you know, something physical having to do with money, saying that you're basically the property of someone else, not God. So that's the problem with that. So Ezekiel chapter 9, I'm pulling it up right now, so it may just take me a quick second here. And I'm going to pull it up in the, uh, in the, uh, I'll put the link below, but you can pull up the Jewish uh, scriptures online um, at Shabbat.org. And the Rashi's commentary is on there. It's really not so different from the King James Version if you're looking for the overall, you know, meaning of it. So, so this is Ezekiel chapter 9. <clears throat> then he called into my ears with a loud voice, saying, Bring near those appointed over the city, and each one his weapon of destruction in his hand. And behold, six men coming from the way of the upper gate, which is turned northward, each man has a sledgehammer in his hand, and one man among them clothed in linen with a scribe's tablet on his loins. And they came and stood beside the copper altar. So this is, you know, you're seeing the copper altar is in the temple. And the glory of the God of Israel lifted itself upon the cherub upon which it had been to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed in linen upon whose loins was the scribe's tablet. And the Lord said to him, so we don't know who this man is, right? Um, and the Lord said to him, pass through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and you will mark a sign upon the foreheads of the men who are sighing and moaning over all the abominations that were done in its midst. And to these he said in my ears, Pass through the city after him and smite, and let your eye spare not and have no pity. Old man, young man, and maiden, young children and women you shall utterly slay. But to any man upon whom there is the mark you will not draw near, and you will commence from my sanctuary. So it, it goes along with the scripture that Christians will be familiar with that Yahshua said, which was, uh, judgment begins at the house of God. So starting from there, um, I'm just going to leave Ezekiel there for a minute. Now the mark that is supposed to be on the foreheads, or guessed to be the mark, is a tav. Tav is a Hebrew letter, and it, it also stands for Dan, the tribe of Dan. And if you understand what Dan's job was, um, part of his job, part of the tribe of Dan when they were wandering through the wilderness, was to go behind um, the encampment of the children of Israel, you know, and anything that was lost or dropped or left behind, the tribe of Dan would, would gather and pick it up. So nothing would be lost, right? So we can see already here that God has this picture of like, none of his people are going to be lost. Now, even if they die, which later on in Ezekiel chapter 9, it looks like, you know, as I read it, it, it pretty much says that later on he'll say, you know, you got to kill those people too. Um, you know, I'm going to show you the Tav real quick. And then I'm going to go ahead and read the rest of Ezekiel chapter 9 to you. So let's take a look at the Tav. So you can kind of see what it looks like. Okay, here we go. I'm going to turn this camera around here for a minute so you could see. I'm pretty sure you could see that right there. Yeah, you can. Okay, so you can see on the top the modern Hebrew letter Tav, but below it I want you to look at the Hebrew letter Tav at the time of Ezekiel. See it? All right, so this apparently is some kind of uh, mark that I guess God and people who can see into the spirit realm can see. And God marks the foreheads of all those that are his. And how does he identify them? They're the men who are sighing and moaning over all the abominations that were done in its midst. Like, what were the, what were the abominations? The abominations that were done in the midst, in my mind, are idolatry. Uh, idolatry is worshiping anything that's not God. Right? So we can look up at the stars and the heavens and we can see God's 
handiwork and, and it can cause us to worship the God who created it. But there's an overlying theme throughout the whole Bible, and that is that our God is one. The Lord is one. So I could take that from, uh, I can give you a couple of scriptures for that too. I know that Elijah said it. Hold on one second. Like I said, I'm going to shoot in from the seat of my pants here for you. Right, so I might even start here with the Gospel of Mark to prove this point. Um, it mentions that, <clears throat> well, Jesus says that the two greatest commandments, the first commandment is that the Lord our God is one, and you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength. And the second one is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I'm going to take this from also a Wikipedia article so you guys can look this all up and you can do further research if you'd like, but um, this is from an article called uh, Shema Yisrael. So it starts off with the hero Israel are the first two words of a section of the Torah and it is the title better known as the Shema of a prayer that serves as the centerpiece of the morning and evening Jewish prayer service. The first verse encapsulates the monotheistic essence of Judaism. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, one God. Um, you have Deuteronomy uh, 6 4 says the same thing. And I wanted to pull up the part, the scripture specifically with Elijah, and read it to you. So everybody remembers the story probably where uh, Elijah calls down fire. Um, there was a situation. Let me get just pull this up. This will be just a little disorganized, guys. I'm sorry about that. But I'm kind of crunched for time here. So 1 Kings 18.25. This one, I think, will be the, the King James Version. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one of the bowls and prepare it first. Let's just read the whole chapter. What the heck? 1 Kings 18. I love this story. All right. First Kings chapter 18. And it was after many days that the word of God came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, appear to Ahab, and I will give rain upon the surface of the earth. And Elijah went to appear to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in the land. Ahab had called Obadiah, who was over the household, and Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. And it was that Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah took one hundred prophets and hid them, fifty men in a cave, and he nourished them with bread and water. And Ahab said to Obadiah, Go in the land, to all the wells of water, and to all the brooks. Maybe we find grass, and we will save the lives of horse and mule, and we will not lose our beasts. Um, Elijah had put forth a decree that there would not, you know, no rain would fall until he gave the word, and it caused a, a famine in the land. So they're talking about bringing their, their horses and all that down to some brooks to get some water. They divided the land between them to pass through it. Ahab went on one way by himself, and Obadiah went one way by himself. Now Obadiah was on the road, and behold, Elijah was in front of him. He recognized him and fell on his face and said, Is this your master, my master, Elijah? And he said to him, This is I. Go and tell your master, Here is Elijah. And he said, What have I sinned that you have delivered your servant into the hands of Ahab to kill me? Because Obadiah knows that, that Ahab hates, hates Elijah. Uh, this has to do with uh, Jezebel, because Jezebel was an idolater. Um, she worshipped Ishtar. Um, you know, they sacrificed children. It's a female goddess. Uh, much like in my mind, the, the, uh, the Trinity, the three gods being set up by the Catholic Church, where you have Mary... And this Jesus, who we're supposed to worship as a god, and now they're putting Mary on crosses and showing her, you know, 
crying and all these things. And who knows who they're going to prop up as the third part of that. But, but this is where we always run into problems. There's only one God, just one, just one. And even people, whether they're Muslim or Christian or Jewish, people who seek God as one, seek his oneness, the, God says he'll guard them like the apple of the eye, right? So this, this doesn't matter like what church you're in. It does matter because it will affect you. But in the sense that whenever anybody is crying out to the one God, they're crying out to the same God, right? One God, one God for all of us. So you see that um, the ten tribes, you know, Ahab was king over, over the ten tribes that are lost now. And this was shortly before they were dispersed and, and lost entirely. But Jezebel had instituted this, uh, of course, Baal worship and Ishtar. She brought her foreign gods with her and it brought a whole problem to all of Israel. And when they, like I said, when they look up archaeological remains to this day, they find these rocks that say, you know, praise God and Ishtar, his prophet, or and Ishtar, his, uh, you know, and this is the, the problem we see now that's going on. So Jezebel clearly hated Elijah because he was a prophet of God and he opposed her openly. So Ahab, Obadiah is saying, Ahab's going to kill me. You know, why have you, why would you use me to pass this on? And as the Lord, this is verse 10, as the Lord God lives, if there is a nation or a kingdom where my master has not sent to search for you, and they have said he is not there, and he adjured the kingdom and nation that they did not find you. And now you say, go tell your master, here is Elijah. He's saying you've been hiding, and now you're, now you're saying, you know, go tell him here I am. And it will be that when I go from here, and a wind from the Lord will carry you to a place I know not where, and I will come to tell Ahab, and he will not find you, and he will kill me, yet your servant fears the Lord from my youth. So he's saying, you know, Ahab can kill me, but, you know, I'll hide you away, Obadiah. My master was surely told what I did when Jezebel killed all the prophets of the Lord. I hid 100 men of the prophets of the Lord by 50 men in a cave and provided them with bread and water. And now you say, go tell your master, here is Elijah, and he will kill me. And Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts before whom I have stood lives, I will appear to him today. And Obadiah went towards Ahab and he told him, and Ahab went towards Elijah. And it was that when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said to him, is this you, the one who brings trouble upon Israel? And he said, I have not brought trouble upon Israel, but you and your father's house, since you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and you went after Balaam. So, just starting right there. Okay. Um, there are really, if you read the, the New Testament, and, you know, I can go into this further, maybe next Sunday I'll do a little study on this, but you'll see that there's two conflicting stories in the New Testament, and this used to always really bother me, because... Uh, I would read James, and James being like uh, the book of the, the New Testament that resonated the most with me. And it says something completely different from what Paul says, right? So you'll see that as you go through the New Testament, that there's, there's Yahshua, Yehoshua, how, you know, the one we call Jesus, who said, you know, people came to him and they said, who's, you know, They were asking him, and he said, you know, there's only one that's good, and that's God, right? Worship him. Or he said, worship the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor is yourself. Once again, he's not saying worship me, right? He's not saying he is God. And that would be blasphemy if he did, because God is so great that, yes, he has human representatives here on earth, but if no human can see God and live, Think for a minute. God is not a man. God's not a man. He uses men, right? But there's only one God, and he rules the whole universe. And the mortal body of a man could not contain him, period. It's just true. But, you know, you see that Yahshua said, you know, salvation is of the Jews. Google that. He said that. Uh, he told his followers to... 
go and study under the Pharisees and learn everything they taught. The Pharisees believed in the oral Torah, not just the resurrection, but the oral Torah. And so he said, don't do what they do if they're being hypocrites, but do what they say, right? And we know that the early followers of, of Yahshua, the Ebonites, they did not believe Mary was a virgin. They were, uh, they were Jews. They were Jews. You can see that even when this, this issue of Peter and the disciples was brought to Gamil, who was a, a Jewish, <laughs> you know, great Jewish authority at the time, he said, leave him alone, you know, and we'll see how this movement goes and what happens with it. And what happened with it is that all the early and the first believers were killed off or died, you know, and the, it, it was part of Judaism, though, because think about this. Would a Jewish leader put a stamp of approval on Jews that had turned to idolatry? Like Jezebel and Ahab. No, no. The early, what we call Christians now, they were Jews. And we can get into that later, but the, the, one of the misconceptions about calling Jews Jews is that we always think that it just means the tribe of Judah, but it means a person who's not an idolater, you know, who just worships the one God. So, Basically, as you read through the New Testament, you're going to see these scriptures that conflict. Like in James, you have him saying, you know, you know, even the demons fear God and tremble. But know you not, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. Right? Even Abraham, our father, was justified when he obeyed God and put Isaac on the altar. Right? Uh, how do we know we love God? We keep his commandments. His commandments are not grievous. Uh, they're a joy. Um... But we see that the Christian church has done this blasphemy where they've said that Jesus nailed the law to the cross. Like the Ten Commandments and all the law. And that if you get circumcised, you know, then, then no longer will Christ profit you anything. Paul taught this type of gospel. Um, and whether it was Paul or whether they, they put the name of Paul on someone, and used, you know, combined works from different people. I don't really know. But I know this. There's two different stories in there. There's one where a man who I believe was a Messiah, Yahshua, preached about the one God. And then we have, you know, a few hundred years later, this, this coming in of this other gospel that is the one that we've all been sort of taught. In fact, you know, Protestants like to think it's only the Catholics, but it's not. Martin Luther wanted to get rid of the whole book of James, right? The book of James. The book that, tell, that tells the truth the most. Why? Because he said the book of James that talked about obeying God's commandments uh, was like a blasphemy to the Christian religion and ran contrary to everything that they were teaching. And, and you know what? Martin Luther was right because they were teaching a false gospel. So for anybody who's, who's curious in that, I would go back and read the book of James and I would look critically at all the places where it conflicts with the stories that are in the other Gospels. Or say if you're reading Matthew, you read through Matthew and it's, it's all good, and then you get to the very end of Matthew, I want to say it's chapter 25, and it says, Go baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you can look at the footnotes, and it says, and that part about baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, it was never there. It was added. And so to say all that, you know, that this has been an issue. What's going on here with Ahab as Ahab's talking to Elijah and Ahab accuses Elijah the prophet of being the one who brings trouble upon Israel. And, and Elijah says, no, I didn't bring that trouble upon Israel. He said, you did it, Ahab. He said, I didn't bring the trouble upon Israel, but you and your father's house, since you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and went after Balaam, you you did this. And so Elijah says, And now send and gather for me all of Israel to Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal, 450. Sorry, <laughs> the prophets of Ashtoreth, 400, who eat at Jezebel's table. So Elijah's having it, wants to have a showdown on Mount Carmel where the prophets of Baal have their altar to their god, to Baal, and Elijah's got his altar to God. And I'm pretty sure a lot of you are real familiar with this story. And Ahab sent among the children of Israel, and he gathered the prophets to Mount Carmel. And I'm going to point out right now that the children of Israel, the, all of the children of Israel, the lost tribes, 
Um, there's so many in the whole earth, in every nation, I believe, they're, they're there. That you're going to find that Muslims are part of Israel, and so are some Christians, and so are people who are not even part of a religion. But moving on from there, let's see. And Elijah, this is verse 21, drew near to the people and said, Until when, okay, until when are you hopping between two ideas? If the Lord is God, go after him. And if you think it's Baal, then go after him. But the people did not answer him a word. Because as Elijah's on Mount Carmel with his altar for God, and Baal's got his altar, you know, the, the prophets of Baal have their altar to Baal, all the people are standing and they're watching this, this showdown. And Elijah spoke to the people, I have remained a prophet to the Lord by myself, and the prophets of Baal are 450 men. So he's saying, I'm one prophet of God here on this mountain, and you've got 450 prophets of Baal here. And let them give two bulls, and let them choose one bull for themselves, cut it up and place it on the wood. This is their altar for Baal, but fire they will, they will not put on it. And I will prepare one bull. And I will put on it. Now, why is it that he's got one bowl? I think part of that has to do with he's saying it's one God. I'm just going to. And he says, I will put it on the wood and fire I will not place. So he's saying, Elijah's saying like, whichever God answers by fire and brings fire down upon the altar is the real God. That would truly be supernatural, by the way, to see fire, pillar of fire come down from heaven and consume the altar. And you will call in the name of your deity. And I will call in the name of the Lord. And it will be that God will answer with fire. The God that answers with fire, he is the real God. And all the people answered and said, the thing is good. And Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, because the people are confused. Because they don't want to disobey God. And also you have, under Jezebel and, and uh, Ahab's reign, the prophets of God were being killed. And the prophets of Baal appeared to be being prospered and, and proliferating. And so the people, I believe, uh, some of them legit wanted to serve God. But I think they were confused, just like we are now. So all the people answered and said, the thing is good. But, you know, get, let's see who answers by fire. And Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose for yourselves the one bowl and prepare it first, since you are the majority, and call in the name of your deity, and fire place not. So don't put any fire on the altar. And they took the bowl and he gave them and prepared it. And they called the name of the Baal from the morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice and no answer, and they hopped on the altar that they had made. So they're hopping on it, they're dancing on it. And it was noon that Elijah scoffed at them, and he said, Call with a loud voice, for, for he's God, right? This Baal guy. Uh, perhaps he is talking. Or maybe he's pursuing his enemies. Or maybe he's on a journey, perhaps he is sleeping, and he'll soon wake up. And... They called with a loud voice and gashed themselves. They cut themselves um, to make themselves bleed for Baal, as was their custom, right? That probably also sounds a little bit like the, the Catholic thing where you'd flog yourself and you'd whip yourself. Um, <clears throat> with swords and lances until blood gushed on them. Now, that that's pretty sad, but that's what they did. Now, Elijah is scoffing them when he says this. He's saying, well, maybe your God is out talking or pursuing enemies or he's on a journey. Maybe he's sleeping and soon he'll wake up. The whole idea is here that the God, the one God, the God that we serve, he could be out talking to someone or pursuing his enemies and he could still come and call and fire could still fall because he is omnipresent, right? And that's part of Elijah's mockery in my opinion. And as the afternoon passed and they feigned to, oh, and they feigned to prophesy until the time of the sacrifice of the evening offering. And there was, so they're pretending to prophesy. They're saying things as if they're having prophecies and Baal's going to show up or whatever. And there was no voice and no answer and no one was listening. And Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. And all the people came near to him. And he repaired the torn down altar of the Lord. Elijah took 12 stones corresponding to the number of the tribes of the son of Jacob, Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came saying, Israel shall be your name. He built the stones into an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench as great as would contain two selah of seed around the altar. Uh, this, I can't remember the exact mathematics of it, but this is so many gallons of water, I want to say it's in the hundreds. And he arranged the wood, so he put trenches around, so on Elijah's altar, he says, not only am I, the fire is going to come down and supernaturally light this altar, but I'm going to build trenches around it, like a moat around a castle, and I'm going to fill it with water, so you could see that 
but this doesn't prevent my God. And he arranged the wood, this is Elijah, and he cut up the bull and placed it upon the wood. And he said, Fill me four pitchers of water and pour them on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, Repeat it. And they repeated it. And he said, Do it a third time. And they did it a third time. So three times they're pouring all the water. And the water went around the altar, and also the trench was filled with water. And it was when the evening sacrifice was offered that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that at your word have I done all these things. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, and this people will know that you are the Lord God and you have turned their hearts backwards. And the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offerings. and the wood, and the stones, and the earth, and the water, which was in the trench, it licked up. And all the people saw and fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord is God, the Lord is God. Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal, let no one of them escape. And they seized them, and Elijah took them down to the brook Kishon, Kishon and slew them there. Elijah said to Ahab, Go up, eat and drink, for now you will hear the rumbling sound of the rain. And so, you know, it goes on here, but... The point is here, guys, is that this, this whole thing was done to show that the Lord, our God, is one. And worshiping Jesus and God, that's, that's two gods. That's not, that's not one God. Um, and that's not what, what Yahshua would have what was it was about if he's the person that I think he was um, that was not what he was about so starting with there we've got the Tav being marked on the forehead and we also have this scripture here Sorry, I'm looking the scriptures up as I go. Okay. Deuteronomy 6.8. Let's just go straight to 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. We're just going to start with verse 1. This is the commandment, the statutes, and the ordinances that the Lord your God commanded to teach you to perform in the land into which you are about to pass to possess it. In order that you fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, keep his statutes and his commandments that I commanded you, you and your sons and your sons' sons all the days of your life, and in order that your days may be lengthened, and you will therefore hearken, O Israel, and be sure to perform, these are the commandments of God, so that it will be good for you, and so that you may be increased exceedingly, just as the Lord God of your fathers spoke to you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you will love the Lord your God, all your heart and with all your soul and with all your means or with all your might and these words which I command you this day will be upon your heart and you will teach them to your sons and speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk on the way and when you lie down and when you rise up and you will bind them for a sign upon your hand and they shall be for ornaments between your eyes the commandments of God and that that's how I see it is that our hands and our and our mind and our bodies should be holiness to the Lord and, and they should be for performing and keeping his commandments. But God does mark those that are his, right? 
We use our hands, hopefully, to do works for God. But this idea of putting this uh, RFID chip into someone's hand is sort of, to me, like a person who would maybe... You might think of the Rothschilds or the One World Government, um, the people who are controlling things behind the scenes. They want to be God, and they want to be worshipped like God. So they want, instead of you know, you having sealed on your hands and on your and between your eyes the commandments of God they want you to put a chip that that tells you about the money that you can only spend through them because they want to take over God's position and of course the Catholic Church you know is part of it and a lot of Christians like to think that they're not part of that you know they don't realize Catholics are their Christian brothers and sisters and have almost no doctrinal dis differences really except for the fact that actually the Protestant church has actually taken a lot of the Catholic doctrines and even gone, in my opinion, more off the hook with it. Because one thing I've noticed is that some of the best people I've known have been have been Catholics, particularly old Catholic women, and they do obey the commandments of God because they're, they're not really being taught by a priest. They might go to the Catholic church to pray, and they and they read their Bibles, but they a lot of times, especially the older ones, you know, they sat under uh, priests that were ministering in Latin, so they couldn't even understand it, and so they haven't been uh, infected with this idolatry. Some of them, believe it or not, ironically, um, some of the Catholics don't. There are there are some Catholics that don't have this issue, probably because they've stayed out of these churches. Because what's going to happen, you know, if you're if a frog boils in water, not because it's thrown into a pot of boiling water, because um, if that happened, a frog would jump out. But, you know, everybody's heard this before. But if you put a frog in water and you slowly turn up the heat, the frog will sit there and boil to death. And so when we go into an environment like a Christian church that's teaching, and I'm not speaking about every Christian church, but you're going to find it in Christian churches and you're going to find it in Catholic churches. But if you find people that are preaching this idolatry, that you should be worshiping someone other than the one God, that God's not one. Yes, God manifests, you know, in creation um, in, in, in threes. That's one of the ways he manifests. But that's not. God is one God. It's not to be confused. Um, or, you know, people... You get the, base, the basic idea here, okay? So, here's the thing with the RFID chip. I'll just read this out of Wikipedia. Scroll down a little bit. Here we go. Section 3.7, Human Implantation. Biocompatible microchip implants that utilize RFID technology are being routinely implanted into humans. The first reported experiment with RFID implants was conducted by British professor of cyber, <laughs> cyber, cybernetics, Kevin Warwick, who had an RFID chip implanted in his arm by his general practitioner, George Bobels, in 1998. 2004, the Baja Beach Clubs, operated by Conrad Chase in Barcelona and Rottingham, offered implanted chips to identify their VIP customers who could turn in, who could in turn use it to pay for service. In 2009, British scientist Mark Gasson had an advanced glass capsuled RFID device surgically implanted into his left hand and subsequently demonstrated how a computer virus could wirely, wirelessly infect his implant and then be transmitted onto other systems. Can you imagine if Jezebel had had a chip that could track you everywhere you went? No prophets of God would have survived if she had her way. Um, and it goes on and it says there's controversy regarding human application of implantable RFID technology, including concerns that individuals could potentially be tracked by carrying an identifier unique to them. Privacy advocates have protested against implantable RFID chips, warning of potential abuse. Some are concerned this could lead to abuse by an authoritarian government to removal of freedoms. Now, it really could, and I'm going to actually go into this a little bit. 
Um, I was actually just reading this in Genesis the other day. And it's when, when Joseph goes into Egypt and he ends up being the visor and working directly under the Pharaoh. He runs all of Egypt and the Pharaoh has this dream, right? And he sees seven fat cows and seven skinny cows. And the fat cows are really fat and healthy looking and the skinny cows are so sick looking that he says he'd never seen anything. They'd never seen cows looking that evil, you know, that bad in all of Egypt. And then the fat cows eat the skinny cows or the, sorry, the skinny cows eat the fat cows. And then he sees the corn, you know, and the seven ears of corn and seven are uh, healthy and seven are wilted and the seven that are bad eat the, the, and the seven good fold things of corn. And uh, basically Joseph interprets this dream for Pharaoh and says, there's going to be seven years of plenty. And during those seven years, I want you to save up, or we're going to save up, one-fifth of everything that's brought into Egypt for the seven years of famine. And that's what happens, right? So as the seven years of famine are going on, um, people come first, you know, to buy, to buy their bread and their corn from Egypt. But as time goes on, they don't have any money left. And so they sell their own persons, and they sell their properties. And pretty soon the Pharaoh of Egypt owns all of their property and all of the people... And so when the famine's over, essentially uh, Egypt has been brought in, except for the priests, by the way. He didn't have the priests do that, but all the other people. Egypt's now expanded its territory, and the people who lived on it, who had their own land, are now, you know, essentially serfs. They're slaves for the pharaoh. And yes, this was done, and it, it did help, you know, Israel to survive, and the, the children of Israel it was done to save them. Um, from the famine outside of there, but you can see how this worked. And this is sort of the model that I would think the one world government would be working with. Is that they can spread a famine so severe in all of the land that people would come and they would take a chip and they would sell their own bodies and their own children and their own souls for food to establish a one world government. Because we see that the enemy, okay... Is, is always, the enemy knows the word of God. The enemies of God know the, know the Bible, know the scriptures. They're, there's a mockery where for everything that God has that's a, that's a holy thing, there is a evil counterpart that looks a lot the same, but it's not the same, right? It's not the same. And the difference is, is that one is uncorrupted, you know, you might say a straight path, and the other one is the same thing, but it's been made crooked, right? So you could even take this with food, you know, there's healthy eating that keeps you healthy, and food keeps you healthy and strong, but then there's sort of idolatrizing food, and food becomes an obsession, and it, it becomes like, uh, so important to you that you'll ruin your own health over it. That's not, you know, that's an extreme, taking something that's straight, the desire to eat and stay healthy, and turning it crooked, right? Um, you should love your children and hug and kiss them. And that's appropriate and that's good, you know, but then you have these perverts that are pedophiles and they want to take that beautiful love and they want to turn it into something twisted and they want to add sexuality to it, right? So for everything that God has, there is a an enemy counterpart, you might say. Um, there's this duality. So say you have prophets of God. You have false prophets. They might call themselves clairvoyants or whatever, but then you also have false prophets. Um, the fraud basically is, is using the true thing and it's just changing it, right? It's just changing it. So like, for instance, your desire to maybe, if you're a man out there, to have a wife, that could be a holy and a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that, right? But if that same desire drives you to sleep with a bunch of women and treat people with debauchery and treat your, treat your own body with debauchery um, in this quest, then it is, it's taken something straight and it's made it crooked, right? And so that's always, whenever you see something um, like, it's like this, you know, there's even like in the book of Exodus, when the children of Israel, uh, one of the Pharaoh almost let them go at one point, and he said, "Yeah, you could go now." This was before the the uh, Passover lamb, because he said, he, "There's an evil star appointed against you." It was I want to say it was Draco, um, 
at any point there was a, an astrology thing that his sorcerers could see that if the children of Israel left right then they'd fall into this idolatry which by the way by the way it looks like they did around the time of the uh, the golden calf the worshiping of the golden calf that's because for astrology there's also something godly right we don't understand it all we're not smart enough to <laughs> we don't have all the details okay but there is something with the stars and god does put signs in the skies and there is something to it but the uh the other version of it is very similar it just has been altered right also god has made us overcomers so even when there is a say an evil star set against you a bad sign god can make you overcome just like you know that's that's the whole point we're called to be overcomers and so the astrology that would box you in and say there's no way to avoid this you're going to be dis destroyed or this good thing or this bad thing is going that's not that's that's the twisted version of something holy um there's numbers you know and then you've got numerology right but then you also have gematria and you have numbers that really do have significance throughout the entire bible and you can look at it um the concept of reincarnation, wherein people are, are born over and over again as animals and this and that and the other, and people will see a child who's starving, and the idea of reincarnation, the corrupted version of it is that you see someone who's starving or suffering, and you say, oh, well, that's their case. Let's leave them suffering because God's punishing them for something, and so you don't want to, you don't want to do anything about it, right? Like, they deserve this for something that we haven't seen, but surely they deserve it, sort of like Job's friends. That's the corrupted, right? But there is...